morning. Oh, <clears throat> a couple of more people. Hello. 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 We're getting like a mini a mini family now, aren't we? We. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's everybody in from the waiting room, Lou. Okay, fabulous. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Louise Wildish, and I'm the Director of Engagement at People Dancing. So the Early Years Dance Network falls within my programme of activity, and I work really closely with Liz on planning and development and the strategic element of the Eden Network. Um, in a moment, I am going to, or Liz is going to speak and talk about today. Um, today for us, from People Dancing's perspective, is about listening to you guys. We're all in very strange time still. Um, as of yesterday, we're still in a very, very strange time. Um, and depending on what parts of the country, even more so. Um, so today we want to listen. Uh, what you say in the work that we do today will really influence the network and where we go moving forward. And that's in all of the senses. Um, so there's lots of stuff going on for all of us. But I think um, today for us, from People Dancing's perspective, is to just kind of hear where you're at, what's going on, um, what your needs are, and how the network can support you in moving forward over the next sort of 12 months particularly. Um, so before we do that, um, we will do a bit of housekeeping. And I'm going to hand over to Lindsay, who will just do a few kind of things for today. Thanks, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Louise. Yep. Yeah, so just before we kind of get started properly, just a few bits of housekeeping to run through, as Louise says. So my name's Lindsay um, and I work with People Dancing too, and it's so great to see everyone today. Um, so firstly, just a reminder that we are recording the session today. And so if you prefer not to be seen, not to be recorded, um, then we just ask that you turn your video off for the session. Um, and I'll just let the next person in as well, another person in the waiting room. Um, uh, when we do the breakout rooms later on, they're not recorded, so please do feel free to turn videos back on again then if you have chosen to turn it off now. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce you to Liz, who's going to introduce you to our wonderful guest speaker, Rachel Dean. Um, and uh, I think we mentioned yesterday in the email that um, there will be a short optional practical session with Rachel um, later on today. It's going to be about 10 minutes long. Um, we would just ask that you have a sort of a safe, clear space to move in either you know, out into your room or you can stay seated if you prefer. It is optional, so if you prefer to just observe, that's fine. Um, but also if you prefer just to turn the camera off, go and make yourself a cup of tea and come back after 10 minutes, that's absolutely fine um, as well. Um, of course, we know that life happens. So uh, if you do need to leave your, your computer at any time to go and answer the door, take a parcel, whatever it needs to be, um, that's of course absolutely fine. Just uh, maybe turn off your, com uh, your, your, your computer, your uh, video and mute your mic and then come back and join us when you're ready. We also ask that you mute yourself throughout the session today um, and we can always do that for you if you forget. But of course, do turn your mic back on when we're having the more um, uh, discussion based sections. And you can find your stop uh, and start video and your mute button hopefully down on the left hand side of your Zoom window. Um, just to alert you as well to a couple of viewing formats up on the top right of your um, of your window so you can move between gallery or speaker view during the session but we'd recommend that you stay in gallery view for the duration and um, we'll also be using the chat function today and you can find that on uh, the bottom bar the little chat icon um, and we just invite that if there are any uh, thoughts or comments any kind of prompts for conversation that you really want to share today, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll either respond to them today or perhaps at a later date, but do feel that you can do that as we go along. Um, so I think that's all from me now. Uh, maybe Lou or Liz can, can interject if there's anything that I've forgotten, um, uh, but I hope you have a great session and I'll hand you over to Liz. Hello, um, so I'm Liz Clark and I'm the associate artist for early years that people dancing. Lou and I are just um, reflecting on uh, how we're about 18 months into developing this network and how amazing it is that we've had so many people join us this morning and perhaps if we'd have done something like this 18 months ago we wouldn't have nearly so many people so uh, thank you for so much for joining us um, so my Twitter profile says um, dance is the answer to everything 
Um, and I truly believe that we can achieve a lot through dance and movement. Um, and I also truly believe that we need to be starting that work at the earliest point that we can, which is why I'm such a huge advocate for um, working in early years. Um, and that's exactly what we're here to talk about this morning. Um, so I've been into lots of these Zoom rooms, um, as I'm sure you have, over the past six months. Um, and I can honestly say the best ones that I've been to is um, where everybody's uh, had the chance to voice what's going on with them and people have felt that it's okay to be vulnerable and to say what's really on their heart. Um, because even if you feel um, like your questions aren't answered, sometimes even being able to articulate what's going on or thoughts that you have moves you on one step uh, closer to perhaps finding new possibilities. Um, so uh, I'm really keen that uh, you all know uh, that you are here for a reason today and that your voice and your opinions are very much valued um, and respected um, in this room. Um, we are very interested in your work. I, I know lots of you as you came into the room, it's just really lovely to see your faces. There's some people that we don't, that I don't know very well. Um, if you'd like to get in touch to tell us about what work that you're doing, what thoughts that you have about your work, um, please feel free to do that. We're always looking to connect people up and uh, to, to talk to people about their early years dance practice. Um, so, uh, without further ado, we are going, those of us that are going to get moving, I was saying to uh, Lou and Lindsay, I'm very excited to get my dance pants out of my wardrobe this morning. Mm. It's like, oh, no, it's Tuesday morning, I'm going to get some dance going on. Um, so we are going to get moving for those of us that want to. Um, I've been following Rachel's practice for um, a little while now and just really um, interested that she has run some improvisation work. She's been working outside. Um, she's been working, uh, creating improvisation movement scores for early years and her work just really excited me. Um, it's very inclusive and very accessible. So we are in very safe hands this morning, uh, and I'm very pleased to pass over to Rachel. Hi, nice to be here. Um, if you'd like to move a bit more, if you'd like to stand, then you could stand in a little space. If you'd prefer to do it in a chair, that's also possible. Um, and I don't know if you've been asked to bring a pillow, but if you've got a pillow or a cushion to hand, that would be fantastic. Have people got, got pillows? Oh yes, brilliant. And we're just going to begin by standing with our two feet on the floor, hugging a pillow. And I think we can close our eyes actually. So letting your arms rest into the pillow your feet rest into the floor. Letting your breath flow in and out of your body. And noticing as you breathe in and as you breathe out, the effect it has on the pillow that you're holding in front of you. There's a bit of feedback there, making it a bit e a bit easier to feel what's going on with your ribs, your lungs, your breath. And let's take a little bounce. So you can open your eyes if that feels better. And just finding a little bounce. And find the amplitude that feels comfortable for you. What's the sort of the easiest amplitude that you can find? And if there's anywhere on your body that feels a bit tough, on your knee, your pelvic floor, your neck, find a way to send it somewhere else or to change something so that this is a, a nice, comfortable way to start the day. 
and then perhaps closing your eyes. And in a minute, we're going to try getting a little bit bigger until you get to the point where your feet start to leave the floor for perhaps might just be one or two jumps and then they come back in again. So in your own time, and as it feels right for you, going between this smaller amplitude down into the floor and then moments, which could be one, two, ten bounces where you leave the floor, you get some air for a minute, and then come back down in the floor, into the floor again. And let's give that a specific eyes thing. So I'll, I'll stop now so I, can, so I can watch as well and speak. So when you're down into the ground with your eyes closed, really down and in, and then the moment that your feet come off the floor, your eyes open, you can see around your room, perhaps you can see out of the window, see the room that you're in. The computer is just one part of that. And as your heels come back down into the floor again, your eyes close. So we're going between this personal, internal, tuning in with yourself. And as your amplitude gets bigger, your eyes open, you see the room around you, perhaps see people on the screen, see the things around your room, see the space you're in. And let's do that one more time. So you notice the last time you're coming up off the floor. And when you come back into the floor, your heels are settling in, sinking down. The size of your bounce is getting smaller and smaller until you come to something that's a bit like stillness. And then keeping your eyes closed if that feels comfortable, allowing your hands to let go, and arms to relax. And just see what happens with your pillow. Perhaps you find some kind of equilibrium where it stays there. Perhaps the pillow drops. And as you breathe out, letting go a little more. And a little more. And looking for that moment where the pillow just slips out of your hands. And then just like the pillow slipped, ideally with your eyes closed if that feels comfortable, finding a way to go and meet the pillow. So the pillow just slip down. You're going to slip down <laughs> and meet the pillow. And finding a resting place. So you don't need to be able to see me at all. You can just listen to my voice. Finding a resting place on the pillow. And I actually can hardly see anyone now, which is quite nice. So it's kind of, this is a private, quiet thing. Got that benefit of being at home, which is really your thing. And in this resting place, just noticing which parts of your body are in contact with the floor, which parts of your body are in contact with the pillow, which parts of your body are in contact with the air. And then in your own time, shifting to a different resting place. So shifting to a new resting place with you, the floor and your pillow. And again, mapping out which parts of your body are in contact with the floor, with the air, 
with the pillow. Which parts are supported directly and which parts are hanging. And in your own time, shifting to a different position. And each time you arrive in a new position, just taking a moment to take it in, to read this position. And whenever you're ready, shifting to somewhere new. Lovely. And next time you shift, noticing what it is that drives you. What's the thing that moves you on? Is it something that's uncomfortable? Is it something you've spotted that you want to be able to see a little bit more? Is it a desire for your fingers to move? What is it that moves you on into that next position? So in your own time, Finding a resting place, taking it in, working out what it's like, and waiting to be driven on to a new place. doing this but just shift our sense of focus so up until now we've been looking for resting places and moving between them let's just shift our attention so our attention is more on the journey so we begin moving until we stop and rest so we just flipped our attention so our attention's on the moving part rather than on the resting part so whatever it is that drives you onto that next resting place. And your resting places, your pauses, might might not look like the same as the first one you found you could find a resting place that's a bit more like vertical you could find a resting place where some of your body is supported and some is hanging or more active Until now, you've mostly, uh, mostly been resting on top of your pillow. Is there a possibility for the pillow to rest on top of you? So somehow your journey takes you to a resting place where the pillow rests on top of you. Noticing whether your eyes are open or closed. Making a choice about what's most useful or interesting to you in each moment. When you want to see what's around you, see where you're moving towards, where you're moving away from, the space that you're in. And when you want to close your eyes and concentrate more on the sensation of your own body. Perhaps you might even find moments when the pillow is not resting on anything.
And we're going to start to think about heading back towards our chairs. So finding a way for the pillow to rest on the chair, for you to rest on the pillow, for the pillow to rest on you. But we're going to take a little while to get there before we start looking at the screen again. So carrying on with this, finding a resting place. And moving on to a new resting place. So some combination of you, chair, pillow. And let's keep our eyes, if they're either closed or in a really nice wide visual field of the whole room. So we're not getting to that place where we're looking at the screen just yet until each of us individually is ready for that. So when you get to the point where you're ready to sit there, open your eyes and look at the screen, but no rush. Oh, it's nice to see everyone come back. I haven't seen all this. <laughs> so when you're ready, then you open your eyes and, and you can look at the screen. Hi. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. It's uh, it's it's great to move. Yeah, thank you. Um, we we're going to open up for some questions uh, for Rachel, and um, just before we move on, um, so um, if you have a question, you can either use the uh, in the reactions. You can um, uh, raise your hand. Um, or it's sometimes easier just to just to raise it um, uh, and uh, um, so let's just kick off if if anybody's got anything that they would like to ask Rachel about her work or her process. Liz, did you say in the chat? Sorry, I I missed that bit. No, you can just raise your hand, Joe. Hi. Hi. Excellent. Yeah. Um, really interesting, interested in language in early years. Um, with um, I was really interested in the obviously the words that you were just then using. Um, and just obviously you're teaching us now, we're all adults here. And just so how in, in that activity there, how you would um, perhaps present that to, to children because um, I can't remember the exact words, but as I was going through, I was thinking all oh, these felt quite adult, you know, words. I think like, I can't remember what it was, was um, to do with the journey piece and things, but just, yeah, just how you would sort of adapt the language perhaps to present yeah. that idea. Um, because that's one of the things that I am always really interested in, um, that particular activity that you were doing. Um, I've used in beds sort of in nursing homes and obviously the language would be very different um, and then working with you know little children and things so yeah just how you'd present it. Um, uh, yeah I would definitely use very different language and I was definitely using that language for for this group today. Um, I would probably use a lot more questions I'd say can you do this, can you do this, um, um, I'd use a lot fewer words, a lot shorter sentences. So what would I say? I'd say, um, can you bounce? Can you bounce higher? Can you feel your feet on the ground? Can you bounce down? Can you bounce up? Um, can you let your pillow drop to the floor? Can you drop on your pillow? Um, I might talk about resting in a bed. So like you're going to sleep 
and now you're waking up and where can you go now? And now you're very sleepy again. Oh. And are you waking up? Where are you going now? Oh, oh, you're very sleepy again. Um, yeah, and probably more about an idea behind the thing rather than the, the physical description, which I think um, adults and people with a real interest in dance and the body are more up for and kids less so. And parents less so as well, because I work a lot with, with kids and parents together. That's, that's my favorite way to work with kids. <laughs> So when you're thinking about a movement score that you create, Rachel, are you thinking you're thinking about the theme and the idea behind it rather than the rather than the fit the physical actions and separating yes. it from the story or the idea or the or the theme? Um, yeah, although I might have some sort of idea of the kind of movements that might come up, actually they'd usually be very different and hopefully they would be. And if if people come up with different things that I've never seen before, it shows that they're really engaging with, with the idea rather than, yeah, it shows that people are really engaged with it. Um, I suppose I'm very often thinking about the interaction between parent and child as well. So how the theme or the prop could can help that. So it's something, it's often really something for the parents because the kids just, just, as we all know, just move all the time and play all the time. And it's more, the instructions are very often more for the parents to have some specific way to to interact in that moment um so because an adult sort of more wants to know what they're doing and that we're doing a particular thing whereas the kid will will you know you can't you can't stop them moving and making things up can you any other ollie Hi, hi, thank you for that, that was lovely. Um, on that note that you just said last time uh, about, you know, can't stop children moving around and making their own moves. Um, what, like, if you're, if you're doing a score where it's sort of, now you're sleepy, now you're waking up, and all the children are just leaping around and not into the sleepiness, um, is, is that okay? Would you adapt it? Because I have a lot of moments <laughs> when, I think I kind of build the energy up too much and then find it hard to bring people back down again. I just wondered if you've got any thoughts on that. It's a really good question. And I, I have to try and work out when it's about what's best for the class and when it's about my ego. And I know like if I suggest something and everyone does it, it makes me feel really good. And I'm like, yeah, this is going really well. And if they're doing something else, I can feel a bit panicked. So it depends on how confident I'm feeling that day. And it depends on whether I know that the group are kind of with me and trust me. And mm. I certainly always say to parents at the beginning, if your child is interested in something else, if they're doing something different, then that's absolutely part of it. Go with it and maybe we'll draw that back in. Don't feel that they have to be doing the same thing. Yeah. So that's definitely the theory, whether I feel like that in every moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that um, sounds familiar. But I'll usually look for at least one bit, e even if they don't keep doing this. I think, OK, at the end, I'll try really hard and do it for a bit longer. And then fit. I've quite often always, like as I'm sure lots of people do, often do a relaxation at the end. So then the parents get used to it, the kids get used to it. And then when they know it's coming, it, you know, is more likely to happen yeah. for at least some of them. Thank you. Joe. In response to that, could I also just put it out there that um, I, I find at times um, that what I do in a session is also impacted by what is coming after the session. So for instance, if it's in a, a like a parent and child session where um, they're going off to like play with their friends after on a play day or walk home or whatever or in the buggy for a nap, if it's in a kind of nursery setting where they're having to have like lunch after for instance um, this kind of being able to step back into the world after what we do is quite important to recognize that and as I found it especially when working um, in reception you know when they've got to go to another lesson as such but does that impact on on what you how you structure your sessions or do you have a similar structure 
dependent on wherever you work? I'm trying to think. I think I'm almost always in a sort of standalone session where I don't know what they're going to do next. They, you know, it's, they're going off with the family. Okay. Trying, I think about, I've worked, it's a different setting, but I've worked quite a lot with adults with learning disabilities when it is in part of a kind of their full day where they're doing different things. Uh, yeah, I'll, def I'll definitely still try and end with that moment's quiet, even if they're then going into busyness. Perhaps a bit more kind of then coming to afterwards or something. Anyone else? Just raise your hand so I can just... Ruth. Hi, Rachel, thanks for that. That was really lovely. A great start to the day. Um, I'm just wondering, when you work with parents and children, how much do you talk to them about um, tuning into their children or listening to their children's bodies? And how much do you just sort of let the improvisation flow of, of its own accord? So I, I guess the question is, how much do you sort of try and relieve their anxiety or inhibition and try and help them to know that it's OK just to go with anything and, and be or do anything with their child or, or how much do you sort of think well let, let's just see how it goes and, and not use words um i think i'm i know that this week I've, I've said to both both groups i was working with um that this tracks three and a half minutes we normally talk to our kids all the time. It, that's a really positive thing. That's how we interact. But for this three and a half minutes, let's do something different. Let's see if we can do this without any conversation at all. So you're just interacting with the child, which feels like quite a lot to ask. I feel a bit embarrassed asking it, but um, it went really well. And then, although the rest of the session, I didn't specify whether to talk or not, I feel like it, it carries over a bit. And probably I'll put that in every week and then, yeah. Anyone else? Give us a wave. Monica. Hi, uh, thank you, um, Rachel. Um, I, I was thinking that this is maybe a session that you do on Zoom or uh, we, because you work with the pillow. Uh, and I was just wondering how much maybe the agency of the parents dancing with their children in at home has maybe been very positive in, in compare maybe to the studio or maybe it wasn't or it hasn't been a, a change or a shift sorry um, i actually haven't delivered anything for children or for parents and children on zoom at all um i held off and i'm now doing stuff um in a park um i know from for myself i feel like the agency of being at home is really good because you can get out of the way of the screen you, like today i couldn't see anyone for the whole thing which is, you know it like it's really clearly your own thing but i, I can only answer that for myself i'm sure there's other people could could answer that for parents and kids and yeah i will be interested well i'm working in in dublin and uh, i just find it a bit uh, positive this idea to work on on zoom <laughs> Because sometimes the parents are, uh, they have a lot of inhibitions to work, uh, like to, to play with them or to dance with them, uh, with other parents maybe. And at home, it has been easier. So I just, yeah, it's maybe a question for. Others. My experience as a parent doing things with my kids on Zoom hasn't been as positive as being in the studio because they're a bit, there's all the usual things to kind of get wound up about or to go off and do, or I don't want to do this. Whereas in the, when the, in the studio, they just go for it. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and um, there's a the little bit of research has been done about kind of um, children's experience of, of working on Zoom. Um, and, and I think that they're, there is that thing that you can disappear from from the camera, so you you can almost you can almost be incognito. Um, but but I think it's the research. Some research has clearly shown that you know children's engagement with the screen um, is is not 
uh, is nowhere near as good as 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 being in per you know in person. And actually, what's important about the parent child classes over Zoom is the practitioner leading the session talking to the parent and the parent interacting with the child so it's kind of like that con the parent acts as that conduit rather than the child uh, interacting directly with the with the screen um i mean that's that's what the that's what the research has shown i'd be interested to know what, what anybody else's experience of that um has been of, of doing kind of play-based improvisation based work over zoom with children does anybody else have anything to add? I don't want to keep, sorry, I don't want to like keep talking. <laughs> um, well, one, one of the things that I've been reflecting on is like connection points. And I think sometimes in studio or outside or via, because I've done one Zoom and the, so anyone, but I've also done a Facebook Live where like Facebook Lives where I can't see anybody but they are communicating through me, to me through the comments. So you're getting a kind of completely different. So for me, it's always about recognizing where the child is connecting. So are they, as an instructor of a space, a facilitator of a space, is my connection point to the adult? So if it's the adult, then that's where I'm thinking about the language that I'm using to support the adult, to support the child. Or is my connection about the prop, so the object? So I've generally worked with, you know, multiple objects and me, me using the language that connects back to the object and the possibility of the object and the permission that that gives the child. And I think the permission as well that um, oh, I've got these ideas are coming in and kind of relaying those back, but also the permission to go off on one, you know, to kind of, and then that kind of balance. So for me, it's like thinking about, yeah, where, how the ch child connects. So, and the, and how I support that connection. Um, so in the Zoom, um, I didn't really use, the, the screen wasn't the connection point. That wasn't where the kids were seeming to connect. So I really, really focused in again in the prop and the world that they were creating a little snippets up. So I think it's how I reflect back where they're connecting. I don't know if I'm making sense, but. Yeah, you are, Jo. Yeah, and, and, and it, it leads me um, really nicely just to, because we've got a couple of minutes left, Rachel. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about how you created the Potter Newton um, play park map? Because not <laughs> everybody on here will be, will be um, know about that. And I wonder if that's something that we can share with everybody after the. Yeah. Um, so I'm working with uh, Hale's Play Playgroup, which is my local playgroup. Uh, we've got funding from the National Lottery to run uh, creative movement activity for parents and preschoolers. We got that in March <laughs> um, and then obviously couldn't run sessions. So over the summer, I made this play map of the park that's right next to where the playgroup meets and is a lot of the families around here. Um, Oh, and hold it still for a second. So it just gives ideas for things for families to do together in the park. The idea was that it during lockdown, when it was slightly after lockdown, um, but while still nothing much was happening, um, families could go together to play to the park. And a bit like a bit like me saying, let's not chat for this bit, just do it physically. It just gives people some physical ideas to, to do together. Um, and hopefully makes people feel more positively about this, this shared space, which is quite great. Um, yeah, Liz was asking about how I made it. I mean, this was a bit, almost feels like a bit of a cheat because I know this part really well, because I've been there going there daily for years and years with my kids. It was super easy. I just thought of all the games that we play and we've made up and worked out which of those are just senseless and ridiculous and no one else could ever play because they make no sense and which ones have something in that other people could perhaps get something from so they're just little little bits of ideas um like the tree stump can you get all the way around without touching the ground cherry tree slalom there's a line of cherry trees we weave in and out of the trees all the way along the line begin together at one end and go different ways say hello when your paths cross with a hug a spin or a high five um and i when I bumped into parents and kids in the park, 
um, particularly if I recognise them from playgroup, um, but also if I didn't, I'd have a chat to them about the games that they like to play in the park. Um, so that rolling down the hill was something that like, another little boy told me about. Um, and if our, one of the activities on it is, is make up your own one and let us know, which hasn't really happened, but I like to think that people are making them up anyway. Brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. That's great. Um, I'm going to pass back on to uh, Louise now, who's going to move us on to the next part of our session this morning. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Rachel. That was lovely. It was really nice. Um, OK, so when you signed up for today, you would have filled in a form and uh, part of that was about us trying to find out what, what are the current issues, what's happening right now, what's important to you. Um, there's lots of lots of things, but we had to narrow it down. So that helped us to form our breakout rooms for today. And very shortly, Lindsay will put you in a room and you will go into your breakout rooms. And uh, to just to reiterate what Liz and I said at the beginning, it's really we really want, really want to hear from you and get uh, your thoughts and have a listen. And um, we have asked people to just kind of steer that group. So I will be in one, Liz will be in one, um, Louise Catarega, who's just turn her camera off will be in one and Rachel will lead one um uh, there is a group that hasn't got a leader but it's it's that's just really to, to help you um so if for whatever reason when you go into your breakout room um you're not happy with the room you're in just come back to the main room and have a chat with Lindsay and Lindsay will put you in a room that you are happy in um what I found really interesting was that every single person that signed up pretty much I think every person ticked diversity and inclusion so um, I think at some point we'll see how that breakout discussion goes but it may be that we need to have a whole joint topic with everybody on that subject um, but we can we can talk about that further um, yeah so Liz are you okay to run through the breakout groups each of the individual ones um, and then um, just in a bit more detail I think for us what we would like from each of those groups is is some kind of action but i'll let liz talk that through with you great so um our topics for our breakout rooms are diversity and inclusion um thinking about the current issues within dance for early years uh what needs changing what's working uh the second one is funding and project development are we represented and what are the needs for artists um, work and employment opportunities, talking around the issues um, and understanding the issues around that. COVID secure practice, what are our key challenges and how can we adapt and sustain what we do? And professional development, scoping the future needs for the individual and the early years sector as a whole. Um, so uh, we're just going to have 20 minutes in those breakout rooms and then we're going to come back and feedback. So I think we're ready to go. Um, I wonder if it's worth mentioning as well that the one, the one group that hasn't got um, one of the sort of um, facilitators of this session in it is the second one, the funding and project development one. So if you're one of the four people in breakout room two, um, then your subject is the funding and project development one, but there won't be one of us in there to, to sort of tell you that, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but if you guys are ready, I will set up the rooms and everyone will just whiz over automatically. So are we ready to go? Yeah, and you're going to give us a two, two to five minute warning, aren't you, when you want us to, yeah. I'll send a little message at five minutes and then I'll give you a two minute countdown when the time comes, but you can use up the whole two minutes or you can come back straight away, whatever your group um, wants to do. So we're putting what problems and what things, but also any ideas or signposts or whatever. I think it's totally open, Joe. that's the point, right. and whatever direction it goes and it goes in, but I think at the end of it, we want to try and be really focused so that there's something that Liz and I can take away and do rather than just not do yeah <laughs> okay super so i'm opening the rooms now thanks Lindsay. you're feeding back uh we did we didn't quite decide i've made a lot of notes and said that it wouldn't be me but if somebody wants to does anybody want to or i'm quite happy to shall i do it in, I can shall do I do it in, half. 
Um, so the, one of the things that we was quite common in in our what we wanted to talk about was um, that we identified uh, a, a need for change in terms of confidence around body language and language, um, and that not that that we're, it's not something that we're worried about, but we realised it's an evolving it's an evolving thing, and there's many different layers to different languages that um, people use um, around diversity and um, sorry, um, disability and race. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and it, you know, there can be things that are used in the professional world, things that are used in uh, language that's used in the street. Um, and I think, I think the thing is not to be worried about it, but, you know, it's an ever evolving um, thing. So I've got, I can do that bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should do, do a joint effort. Anyone yeah. want to say, add, add anything from that group? Oh, Shelley, are you saying? Well, I'm going to say, if, if there's anything extra I can add, that we've, we we were talking about access, weren't we, in the group? Um, and we were, we were talking about access points and how do, how do people access what they're doing and where are those points and how can we widen that? Um, and did that connect with the ambassadorship? thing as well and the um and the the idea of um community champions community champions uh, and this peer-to-peer -peer or or kind of connecting people in in that way is that right yeah there was a lovely phrase about um rather than us being the voice for arts that people who visit us are the voice for us telling other families about arts and um, that was um yeah Cr chrissy and i think that was that was about it really a sense of welcome was something that you know how do how do we make people welcome and um, i do have um something to give about um uh, community champions and things like that but i could put it in the chat there's a woman called um does anyone know z arts in manchester um liz o'neill they have a really comprehensive um system of peer support and focus groups etc etc they also ran an entire um, young people's festival everyone in it was from a culturally you know from a background of color or disabled they didn't say anything about that on the posters and it was their most well attended festival ever and there's a report about it so i'll i'll put liz's contact in but that was us i think Have you got a link to that report, Louise? Do you know if it's out? I, I haven't. I haven't. I've been hounding her for it for a while. But should I put up if I put Z Arts in? Um, yeah. I guess we can ask. We can ask. And do you think? Thank that, you, everybody. Do you think that could potentially be a model for us in terms of peer support and what we can do for each other as a network? As a network, I know that I don't know if Lou Wildish wants to pick up on this. We are going to talk about it more. Um, actually, Rose, you, you were talking about how can there be more representation of underrepresented voices amongst young people and children and practitioners. And Lou Wildish, I don't know if you want to pick up on what we're about to do with that. Are you there, Lou? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I was on. I was on mute. Um, sorry, just clarify that again for me, Lou, please. In the, oh, I was oh, the message, and my brain was in the message. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Liz was asking about what about us as the peer group, and um, Rose had raised this as well. How do we um, lift up some of those unheard voices amongst children, practitioners, ambassadors, etc.? And I said, well, <laughs> we are yeah. about to. Um, yeah. Maybe you want to describe what we're about to do. Yeah, it's, a, it's early days, but obviously a lot of it is about identifying people that we don't know, that don't engage with us and asking the question, why don't people engage with us? Do they not see themselves within the work that we do? Uh, are we not using the right language, uh, the right resources? So um, I know it's confusing, we're both called Louise, but uh, Louise and I are working yeah, together <laughs> on, on, on this. Um, 
and just looking at how we can nurture mentor and and what are the barriers and what are the things that we need to do to be able to kind of support but that goes across the board for everybody but specifically so in certain diverse groups uh, and particularly people of color so Lou and I are doing some work around that and as that becomes um you know as we have that a little bit more framed you will obviously be involved in that process for sure um but certainly there's there's a lot of work to do definitely great thank you um so then we come to the funding and project development group um just give me a wave if you were in that group and you're feeding back is that you katie i didn't know that i was feeding back but i don't mind where's everyone else has anybody um, carrie is that you hang on um, I wonder if um, Angard can start us off and talk about her work in Wales, because it's fabulous. <laughs> we were um, just talking about different avenues of looking for funding and how um, quite a lot at the moment we're being directed to look away from the arts for avenues of the funding and to partner with more organisations that aren't arts organisations um, to see how they can support um, the work that we're doing and then we spoke about how documentation of practice is really great in order for us to demonstrate why we're awesome um, and why people should give us money to keep doing what we're doing and we spoke about yeah the various hoops I think um, Catherine was talking it the hoops that we jump through sometimes to get funding and if we can share a little bit more about what we know <laughs> about those hoops um, it benefits everybody as well and knowing what they are and how they are and they're different aren't they they're different in different regions they're different in different countries in the UK um so yeah we spoke about yeah just the different avenues and options that are available especially now especially as we're being encouraged to look further afield and then how do we evidence and we were talking about research and Kath spoke about how they've partnered with a um, researcher in Christchurch who's got a fabulous practice and I know loads of people here have got a fabulous practice as well um, and how the more we share the more the more and then the more awareness and the more um, knowledge and the more or recognition that was the word that we used recognition for the importance of the work that we do and how it can impact um on everyone that is involved with it parents grandparents and children Does your group have any thoughts on on kind of the mechanisms for sharing that knowledge we're talking about the connections between uh between freelancers weren't we and uh, yeah, which this platform is also really helpful with. And from those connections, then we can spread the awareness of what we do and the support that we can get from that. Um, and we were also talking about, I, I mentioned maybe we have Rachel and George also in Yorkshire. Maybe it's something that we can talk about, like supporting each other in Yorkshire. Um, and because we were saying that we had a zoom a while ago too it's great to have these con uh, connections across country and in different places and, and then and we'll be able to up here as well yeah yeah collectively independent love that joe <laughs> yeah great um, and did you have your, your avenues for funding did you have any gems that you could share with us the non the non-arts avenues not yet um <laughs> but um so in wales we're looking hopefully to be able to start a network of welsh artists working with early years and to gain the support in order to put the funding bid initially into the arts council um they asked us to um partner with midyad Mithrin, which is the welsh language childcare provision so it's looking at childcare um providers and settings is kind of one avenue that we looked at and they also asked us to partner with flying start which i think is the equivalent of what sure start would have been in england um and, and looking at those and how if nationwide we can, if we can get into other things that are nationwide then hopefully it allows kind of that sprinkling of practice that we have everywhere through different amazing artists 
to be able to tap into the whole thing sometimes with arts funding I don't know how it is in England but especially in Wales it feels like the funding goes to one bit and then it stays there a little bit and it, and it sometimes doesn't filter through to a whole network of artists that are there and available and if we can tap into the already existing structures that are there are we then able to support more artists to be able to do more, to create more and to share more. Um, so that was the Arts Council from Wales advice to us was to tap into what's already there nationwide wise. Um, and if you have a pool of artists, which we do, don't we? This network is fabulous and it's brilliant. Um, and yeah, how can we disseminate that? But go, go to the top, <laughs> go to the government and, and see where that money's going and, and, and how we can yeah access it. Well, going to the top, definitely. Um, so uh, I was in the group uh, that was talking about um, work and employment opportunities, um, and I'm just going to um, I'm just going to type it in as I go, um, and just uh, just because um, it, it'll help me to think about it. So we were talking about um, new opportunities um, and the online. Um, create new spaces, um, particularly for cross-cultural um, working, but then that also has um, some, neg some um, negative um, disabilities, uh, negative um, aspects to it, so um, that it feels like essentially it has limited via, I can't spell it, spell it, viability, um, currently with kind of the retention of people, uh, that that also some people are concerned about you know uh, their quality of delivery when they're doing um, online work. Um, we talked about how we all know that the world is very different, but actually that it's um, really different for new graduates who were expecting potentially to shadow and to come across people that they would want to work with in classes, and now that's been removed. So I think that really links in with what you were saying, Anne Harrod, about kind of what what networks already exist that we can we can hook those people into, um, that, and that they were really missing um, the uh, informal networks that happen when you when you go to places. Um, uh, we were talking about uh, new modalities giving us new ways of working. So using music, theatre, um, of uh, using mark making and drawing, um, and, and just kind of adding lots of strings to our bows as artists, um, that in terms of opportunities, we are really having to push ourselves um, to get out there, to, to even, even just to keep moving. Um, uh, and that that can feel like a challenge. Um, interestingly, um, we all feel potentially that we're, we're at zero um, and where people have felt like they've had successes is where they've started, uh, is where they've started small um, and potentially had a bit of a low bar. Um, to, to what they were doing, but that, that that's actually opened up new possibilities um, uh, for people. Um, and really interestingly, um, we um, we had some feedback from Southeast Dance about the Arts Council, who are really inviting applications from um, first-time applicants. Um, and uh, who are working in a COVID secure way uh, that can really demonstrate impact in their local community, which is, which is very much uh, kind of what we're about. Um, and the Arts Council really understands the need for the shift in practice and are expecting people to put in time um, for planning um, and I think one of the positive things in our group was just linking up some of the people with with each other, but also with an organisation that could potentially help them 
Um, so I think that's definitely an, an action um, going forwards. Um, just wave your hand, my group, if I've missed anything that we need to add in. Ollie. I don't think you've missed anything. That was a great summary, but I was just wondering what software were you just using? It looked really cool. Was that, were you on Photoshop or what? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Let's just share screen. And then I just had an image waiting in the background and then you can just annotate as you go. Love it. Anybody else from my group? Did I miss anything? No, cool. Uh, COVID secure practice. One very close to my heart at the moment having spent the whole week covered in risk assessments. Uh, give us a wave. Uh, uh, oh, I think that's you, Rachel. Hi. Um, we talked a lot about touch. That would seem to be the main topic. Um, one of us just, just made a piece called touch. Um, another one of us is doing a PhD about the touch connection with children who choose not to speak. So touch is completely key to that. Um, another one of us, um, carried on working in person and with touch in in a nursery with the children who needed to be in children of key workers and with additional needs throughout lockdown um so yeah we talked about touch and the importance of that um there was a nice quote from a conversation with with lisa nelson and colleen bartley whose practices totally around uh, contact improvisation so touch again um about looking at what we can do rather than what we've lost, which was quite, I'm glad someone brought that up at, at the end of our conversation. Um, and someone else said something about letting go of preciousness. Um, but I'm like, this, this is what I've made and I'm really pleased with it. Actually, thing, things have to change. Um, yeah. And anything else? What, what did I miss my group? Um, we talked a little bit about sort of flexibility. Um, so, you know, again, and that kind of relates to, you know, um, yeah, preciousness and saying, you know, we can have an idea of what we want to do, but the, the likelihood now is that when we actually get around to doing it, lots of things will have changed. So just, just trying to kind of bear that in mind whenever we're planning something is that this is, this is our perfect situation, but we need to have kind of plans be, you know, all the way down because yeah, yeah we and we've, we've got to like uh yeah be able to kind of let go of those things um take that that takes quite a lot of resilience doesn't it to be to have plan b c d e and f um yeah i wonder i wonder if it might be something we talk about a little bit later on about how people are feeling about their levels of resilience to keep, keep doing that um yeah. Uh, any, anything else from that group? Yeah, I think that's a really, really, sorry, Liz, I, I think that's a really important point because um, at a time when research is really uh, regaining um, strength in the whole area of embodied practice mm -hmm. and touch is a really, really important um, consideration, not just in the arts, but in terms of um, hat technologies around screen-based use and so on um, and there's a huge amount of funding going into the impacts of COVID um, not, not least on touch um, and also on other things I think that point about how we sustain our own resilience in not being able to touch as a part of a core part of the practice um, is really really important and the irony of that uh, you know amongst all of this research that's going on um, doesn't escape me. So I think we need to maybe keep our eyes on that and keep our eye on on what um, some of the educational research forums like VERA, the British Educational Research Association, are doing around research into such and how uh, perhaps this group can feed into that and be a, um, a consultant to that perhaps or an advisor to that, so that it's not just um, a bunch of academics <laughs> looking at such as a, a, a as a a word rather than as a, an actual thing, a doing, a feeling, a sensing, a making, a stimulator, and so on. Would you would you pop the um, Vera link into the chat, Ruth? Yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. And anything else? I've seen that Louise Cataraga's popped in there, um, the, the Radio 4 
um, program that's about touch at the moment. I know Coventry University have also got some, some stuff on their landing page. Uh, the dance research unit there have got some stuff on their landing page about touch as well. Um, yeah, that perhaps I can share at a later date. Is there anything else from that group? Right. Um, professional development, scoping the needs of the individual and the sector as a whole. Louise? Uh, we also didn't allocate a speech. Is there anyone from our group who want to speak? No. <laughs> Joe. Yeah. You go, Joe. I'm happy to, and if the group are okay, just responding to some of what the, the group before us said, I kind of reflected the potential CPD needs within what you were saying, so I hope that's all right if I add that in. <laughs> um, oh. You were talking very much about, um, because this puts us potentially in, in us changing where our work is going, that um, we have some sort of CPD support on how we adapt our business model and actually looking at um, needing to improve our adaptions within our business, not just our practice. Um, I'm a massive believer at the moment that I think we need to start seeing ourselves as, as business a lot more and that the reality is of this is we've got to earn a living out of it, otherwise we're going to have to leave it. So I do really think we need more CPD on that and including in that we were saying about training um, with funding, funding applications. Um, our conversation was very much focused towards the difficulties of getting our work into schools and settings at the moment. And so um, the CPD around that was like perhaps, you know, the language and know, like knowing your area, how to kind of research your area and know where your in points to places are as well. Is there much more in our Yeah, stuff? just picking picking up on that point, I, I think we just, we, we sort of named some names, didn't we, in terms of the bridge organisations who hold those kind of um, databases and relationships with schools and those sectors and those organisations and then uh, we talked also about the real importance at the moment if you have a relationship with the venue of what that's looking like in terms of how you manage that when they have lots of restrictions and they are struggling in lots of different ways um and then we i think we talked about um I just... back, didn't i and then like we were talking about the needs weren't we very much about kind of analyzing like the need of the school or the need of the group and really focusing in on how we are are useful that you know we obviously we're incredibly creative and we know but being really specific with how useful and kind of what problems we're going to solve because actually a lot of the problems that are being created at the moment we can solve a lot of them isolation we can help to solve that um you know health and well-being we can help to that increase the childhood obesity we can help with that like we, like we can be the answer to an enormous amount of actual problems and we could find that there is an enormous amount of work out there for us actually i'm like really hopeful with that personally i think we just have to um and i think that's another cpd thing is we actually need reflective practice that brings us hope and reflective and this is what i was reflecting on what liz was saying it's like for me, I think one of the things that's kept me resilient is being able to deconstruct my practice to such microscopic elements that I can rebuild it for any scenario. And I think, I'll be really honest, that's come with a skill that I'm a hot, really reflective practice practitioner. And sometimes I wish I could switch off from it, but I can't because I'm really passionate about it. But talking to a lot of people, not everybody's doing that. And actually, when we really break our practice down to such small, small things, we can build them back up for any scenario, any scenario, you know, and, and we can turn up to any occasion and be told that a change is happening. But because we know our practice, we really know it, we can go, OK, I can take that bit out and I can chuck that bit in and it's still going to be beautiful and it's still going to be creative. So I'm getting all passionate now. But I think and I do think reflective practice is something that we should put into CPD. Um, I was on a mental health course a few weeks ago and they were saying that a lot of therapists, dance therapists, 
have supervision. We don't often get that. You know, we don't get that formally as independence. And so we spoke, didn't we, um, about mentoring as well, like being able to support mentoring and... Um, yeah, we talked a bit about mentoring, didn't we? And that, interesting that that seems to be a thread with quite a few of the group discussions. Yeah. Um, and just maybe, so maybe that's something, Liz, for the network we can have a look at exploring. And I think sharing best practice as well. Like, this is no longer about competition at all. This is about all working together and, like, not being precious. You know, anything that works for me, I'm going to tell you guys about it because it means that more kids and more families get to access what we're doing. Like, I think um, as a whole in the arts, at times we can get very precious about things and we do need to, you know, respect intellectual copyright and those types of things. But actually, um, we all want the same result, which is these kids and families to have access to what we do. And I think best practice and promoting and sharing models at work um definitely needs to commit to it so one of the things i would say also is training in like dissemination how we actually capture and disseminate our work and looking at whether we can like have a kind of model of practice that perhaps in the early years network that we kind of dip into for that and writing that in our funding bid so that we get paid to write blogs and share resources to other people if it impacts a whole community of practitioners I'm going to stop talking now because we've got all excited. <laughs> Great, thank you. I've been massively um, scribbling down notes. Um, it'd be good to um, to, to summarise some of these and just and kind of talk around some of these things. So it's my role now to kind of summarise um so i'm going to do that in the same way um as i did with my previous group just because i find it really helpful um to uh yeah to to have a visual and to be writing it down so then if if um and at this point i think i find it really helpful if if i start writing something and you think actually that word needs to go in there and this and then unmute yourself and speak and speak um because we'll all be looking at the screen share um yeah and, and then we'll end up with a, a kind of a, a summary that we're all really happy with does that sound okay lou yeah yeah that sounds great uh, just to say though they'll in very shortly there's going to be an exercise called the whiteboard where we're going to ask everybody for actions or comments and things so um don't worry if you miss that bit and there's plenty of time for you to get your thoughts out um on something virtual um okay so um hopefully you can all see that um and um so the thing that i'm going to start off with is the word precious because that feels like that's come up a number of times um over the course of the last hour and a bit um so the need for um uh networks of sharing um ideas practice um knowledge uh anything else just unmute yourself and just interject like i don't wave because i can't see you anything else that i need to put in there inspiration thank you inspiration um in intellectual copyright though so there is still a protective element to it and a uh, a kind of a value given to it with that sharing process. So uh, it's not uh, taken for granted. The supervision was interesting. Uh, um, supervision. Is, is, was that you, Andrew? Oh. 
what, what, tell me what you mean. Well, I like this uh, the way the way therapists work, where they you reflect on your practice with a particular person. You 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 talk about what exactly happened in that way, and the person just hears your your process and reflects back to you. Kind of kind of what you mean by networks of sharing. Is that different to mentoring, Andrew? I think so. Yeah. I think it's a. Uh, yeah, I think so. And mm. it can be peer supervision. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, <hey. laughs> yeah. Okay. Like, like a budding up kind of thing. Yeah. My, my understanding of supervision is it's there to support you, the practitioner. Not improve you or change you, but just support you. Yeah. Um, I also think in the sharing section, you could put sharing evaluation, sharing documentation, sharing impact reports, so that the work that's already been done doesn't need to be redone. Um, yeah. And we talked about um, sharing uh, stakeholder information so those people literally names and organizations who have the relationships with the audience that you're trying to attract market get work from yeah yeah I, I've tried I've tried I ha I've tried to do that previously um, yeah and, and found that really cha I found that really challenging because it always goes out of date you know it's the same as any database it's always out of date every however long but mm. I mean that's essentially that an element of that sharing is where the regional network development kind of comes in as well yeah yeah there was something really lovely um I don't know if this was done deliberately but in our meeting everybody seemed to be kind of London and South um and I think somebody else mentioned that there was a lot of people from Yorkshire and theirs so um, that was really lovely to be to be able to see those connections happening with people who work in the same geographical region. Um, although, you know, as Takeshi has, has said, you know, we're not limited to geography now. Now we've got a developed online world. Um, I've, I've delivered, you know, and worked with people where, where we've done support type sessions over Zoom and, you know, that has worked. It's obviously not as good as being in the room. Um, but I, uh, yeah, like I wonder what people would want to see from their, from their regions. Uh, for me, it would be a wider spread. Like I've got Southeast dance, but it, and I'm in between, I'm in between two regions. Like we're like the bit in the middle that don't quite meet. <laughs> so there's nothing <laughs> like I'm between pavilion dance and, so I think like reaching out to the people on the edges <laughs> of those regions, because it does seem to be quite centralized still. Yeah. I think probably one of the next we've talked for a while is haven't we that at some point soon we will we're going to explore the sort of regional network stuff as well so we can delve into that a bit more in depth, but I think it, it is really yeah with COVID going on as well, it's so difficult at the moment because everything is, some of it's online. Some people, it's very interesting actually, because some people are saying that they're not doing hardly anything online. Some people are doing everything online and some people are doing a mixture of the two. Um, it might be interesting to um, think about um, creative content because, you know, as artists, we might share different processes but actually what interests us comes out in our work. So for example, the work that I develop is mainly about supporting people to make connections with their relationship with nature and how they can do that in different ways. And I'm a dance artist first and foremost, but actually I work with creativity much more than I work specifically with dance. So I think there's something about content. And if we're working with early years, they're the ones who teach us to move. So it's not about us being clever about how we teach the movement aspect. It's about how we facilitate connection 
And I think that that's something that's really key and it'll give so much more depth to our work and it already does, but just how we share how we can do that. So maybe there is something that might be a bit different from peer to peer supervision, but it might be that someone has been exploring something for a particular length of time and that that might be something that other people may be interested in beginning to incorporate within, within their early years work. Does that encompass it, Anne, do you think, what you've just said? I can't see. Wait a minute, I'll move you. How it comes out in the work we create, sharing our art form development. I don't think it's so, so much about art form development. I think we can use much simpler language and it's about how we, how we share our interests and focus yeah. creatively. And I think if we try and go for much simpler language, we can understand it so much more. And then that means we're more inclusive in terms of listening and talking and responding in different ways. I think that's for me where language is so important. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I loved about the, the event that we ran last November was just the diverse practice that we had. Um, yeah, and I'm so aware of just, um, you know, when I see people's work on social media, the range of work that we have and the uniqueness of each artist's um, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to be able to find a way to really showcase. Um, I wonder whether it's about showcasing. I wonder because I think that the last conference um, that I came to with you um, was brilliant and it really started, people started to show where their interests were and where their thread of, of, their, um, of their creative experience was. I think there's something in exploring that a bit more with people who are interested so that there are overlaps in different in different ways and so that we can learn from each other's creativity to explore our own creativity so therefore how we facilitate that with the groups we work with I think that's different from showcasing there's yeah. more depth in it and I think that's I think that's really important and it'll help us to articulate what we do how we do it and how we can include other people yeah, I think adding in like creative exchange, so it's more of an exchanging process than rather than a presentation process. Well, it's an exploration. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, how I see it. Yeah. It's about exploring deeper. I'm going to um, stop talking. For a while, then. Um, for a while um, Star Catchers up in Scotland were running these really lovely. Um, I think it was uh, fortnightly. Um, Zoom meetings where there would be a theme and, 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 an, and an artist would just be kind of sharing an element of their practice um, and then there would be a discussion around it afterwards and it was every other week and uh, I don't think they're running them anymore but I, was, I went to a few of them and it was just nice to have that kind of regular thing of just you know someone was saying you know this is something I want to talk about I'll do a quick presentation then we can have a discussion and something that you know probably didn't take that much to organize um, and was very regular um, I found that really beneficial and I think a model that, that, that maybe we could do down here um, just to kind of keep that regularity of you know seeing each other um, I think would be really useful. Yeah yeah I was thinking about that George as well about um I know we're kind of we're kind of coming on to kind of actions. Um, is there anything else that kind of has really sparked people or kind of like the? I often talk about what's been the brightest thing for people over the conversation, um, over the past kind of hour and a bit. Is there anything that as a, like a heading that anybody thinks that I, that we we mustn't move on until mm -hmm. we put that down? From ours, maybe reach the word reach yeah. and about the, I, I just felt for my group, a great desire amongst all of us. And lots of us were cross arts. It was quite right that the desire to um, reach broadly with our creativity, you know, across the art forms and to reach more people, more practitioners to include more voices. Yeah, I, I would echo that around tr the, the <clears throat> I know it's one of them, words but the word translation just about um in order to reach more people you have to have a language that's not set in a sector 
And so what does that language look like? How do you, as Anne was saying, you know, simplify the language and it reaches more people. Uh, and that's not about um, selling yourself short. That's just about making sure everybody is really clear as it what it is you're communicating. Yeah. And there's a lot of will to do this and a lot of will to do it, curiosity about the how and the what and the sense that by talking to each other about it, that might help us find out how to reach people, what reaches them. Yeah, yeah, right. I think I'd like to add also the fact that um, there's gonna be seasons to this. And I think us recognizing the seasons, like the actual yearly seasons, like the offerings that that might offer um, and actually, you know, it's getting darker, but can we explore the kind of darkness? You know, can we explore the needing to nest and bed in and all that? And um, but also recognizing there's going to be a season to this pandemic, and that 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 we kind of check in with that. And but we check in it from a kind of offering point of view, like from a, a point of like a starting point of positivity, like perhaps. For me rather than i at the beginning was very much like looking at the negative but it's that moving forward into that starting point of positivity and not ignoring the negative but just <laughs> um yeah so i've just put about hope yeah um yeah being being a kind of a a, a key point about that sort of, yeah that positive having that positive that positive mindset just supporting us all to have those stepping stones isn't it but also just like recognizing that if we need to stand still for a little bit that that's okay yeah and we are all still here to you know be there for people if they need to stand still like just recognizing where everybody is and it's going to be different and And I've just got room for one more up, up up here on the on the left. Anybody's got anything else? No. Okay. 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 Got to share, and I'm going to. Um, hand over to Louise. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for summing all those things up. And uh, obviously, you can always get in touch with us, uh, myself or Liz uh, at any time if there's something that you felt that you weren't able to say or you remember afterwards and you want to communicate. And uh, we will obviously um, collate everything and get that out to you in various different ways. But it certainly gives us some thinking to do. Um, Similar thing there, I was just thinking actually, one of the things I really, really love about this network group is that it's, it's absolutely fundamentally embedded in creativity and practice. And, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of the other networks that sometimes become very, uh, yeah, it's just embedded in its practice, which is fantastic and that's lovely. Um, what I would like to do, I think Lindsay is still alive and well. <laughs> um, we're going to now put up a whiteboard in a second. It's very similar to what Liz has just done. Um, we, what we said right at the beginning when we came onto Zoom was that um, we've heard from you in different groups and uh, just in terms of what you would like the network to action next to support you. So there's loads of things I know, but the whiteboard is an opportunity that literally and I, I might ask Lindsay to talk you through how you use the whiteboard in a second, but literally it's an, a, an opportunity for everybody to, if possible, write down a short few words um, on an action that you would like the network, network to do. And that could be as simple as resources on the website, how to engage with schools, or um, it could be um, a campaign to do this, or it, it, or it could literally be weekly meetings or whatever you feel that as a network we should be doing, uh, it's your opportunity. Or if you can't think of an action and you just wanna make some comments about learning or something that um, was from your group or something that you felt today has uh, given you some learning or insight or inspiration to put that as well. So this is a working document, I suppose, for us to just hear what you've got to say 
and talk about and think about afterwards in order to inform the next one of these and the next few of these and also the sort of strategy if you like of what the network's trying to do and achieve um Lindsay would you be able to talk through how everybody um yeah absolutely so um hopefully I mean you all we, we did test this the other day didn't didn't really so um hopefully everyone will have the sort of permissions to contribute to this so if you hover over the whiteboard um screen window um, hopefully a little bar will appear somewhere on your screen um, and one of the icons you'll see is a little T with the word text with it and if you click on that and then click somewhere on the on the screen um, it should come up with a little cursor like Liz had um, over her beautiful images. Um, Sorry Lindsay be before everybody does that yeah. you'll have a you'll have a view options and then on the right and then if you click down and click annotate that brings up the box. Ah. Sorry. Perfect. Okay. Yes. No, that's good to know because I've already got my little my little bar up, so I wasn't sure of that. Um, it might be yeah, like the the little oh. um, three dots or a little sort of burger menu. Um, but yeah, we can. Don't worry. We're kind of overlapping. We can sort of uh, you know re rearrange all the text boxes later on. Um, but yeah, is anybody having anyone who wants to write something um, having any trouble finding those options? Sorry. So if you go, because there's text and there's mouse, if you go to text and you click on the text, which is the second box in from the left, it should give you a cursor and then you just click the cursor and it brings up a box rather than a mouse or um, some of you've got pencils and stuff. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so there is the little draw, um, the draw icon. And there's the text icon, and then I think that little sort of cursor icon is for if you want to move your your text box around. Um, but if you can find the text box, I think Anne's Anne's found it. <laughs> Alternatively, actually, if you prefer to write in the oh super some coming up, if you prefer to write in the chat, we can always add it to the document later on. Like we should have had some music at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody feel like singing? <coughs> that next time. Yeah. That'd be great. I haven't got any lined up. I could sing a, a sea shanty, but I won't. Oh, uh, please do. <laughs> no, no, I was joking. I can't. I can't so my doorbell rang, and I was out of the room, and I was told how to click on it. Okay, so at the top you should have, uh, on the right hand, you should have a view something. Yeah, annotate, yeah. Go to annotate, and then second one in which says text. Thank and, you. And then if you put your cursor on the white bit, it'll bring up a box and you can just type straight in. Or you can do a drawing or any other form of expression you would like. <laughs> And yeah, don't worry if they overlap. We'll we'll we'll, we'll sort through them all and um, shape them, and hopefully share this as well. Yeah, I was just thinking, Rachel, about whether there is a need to bring somebody in at the next event to speak, like somebody from Arts Council or a funder to talk about uh, early years strategies within Arts Council or anything like that. So if that is something that might interest you, let us know in chat or on here. <laughs> I'll just give it a couple more minutes. Oh, I didn't know you could change colour. All these people who didn't change colour. <laughs> Some kind of body up system to share and reflect on practice different from mentoring. Yeah. 
non hierarchical receptacle. Yeah, linking up with others locally. Thank you, Liz. Nice heart. Yeah, I think there's going to be way more cross-culture, cross-art form linking up post-COVID in order to basically all survive. So I think that'll be an interesting development that might come out of things as well. Thanks, this chat that people are doing now. Yeah, I hear you on that one. Please also feel free, either in chat or on here, to the frequency of things like today. Um, my dog might bark, in which case I'm going to mute in a second. Okay. Right. I think. Thank you, Ollie. See you next time. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Louise. Okay. I think it feels like most people, thank you, Rose, have, have done. So, Lindsay, do you want to Save and close that for me, please. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. There's some really, some really great things for us to, to, to look at then and to focus on. And anything that you've not been able to feel like you can say or write or do, um, Liz and I are always willing and welcome to hear from you guys about the network itself. Um, so um, I'm going to hand over to Liz in a moment just to say, Thanks and goodbye. But I just want to say from people dancing's perspective, thank you so much for coming today. Um, and um, yeah, our emails are always welcome. So if you have an exciting project or you want to just feedback or there's something that you want to um, propose, then please do get in touch with us. But I'll let Liz uh, say the final thank yous and goodbye. So thanks everybody from me and people dancing. Thank you so much for joining us. There's just we're kind of like the after party now, aren't we? We're like yeah. we're like the ones that have stayed to the bitter end. Much respect, <laughs> much respect to you. Yeah, there's no partying going on except on here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute joy. I feel like I've got loads from this morning. Uh, just being in a room with you guys and uh, your. Um, experience and um, yeah we're uh, we're just so thankful that you've come and we wish you a very nice day going out into the world it's sunny here in Loughborough so I hope it is where you are um, and do do get in touch um, as Louise said and uh, we hope that we'll see you all again very soon thank you thank you